in places where people live, you'll often find Chinese individuals, and where Chinese individuals live, there's usually a Chinatown. In fact, over 60 million Chinese people have left the mainland and now reside in over 170 countries. These overseas Chinese are often referred to as Huaqiao or Huaren. Today, they've established massive Chinatowns in at least 26 countries, spanning over 103 major cities. This video aims to discuss how all of this was made possible. China's southern coastline includes provinces like Fujian, Guangdong, Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, and Hainan. Most of these 60 million overseas Chinese hail from these four provinces. Half of them come from Guangdong and 35% from Fujian. So why did so many leave these specific provinces? In a word, survival. This trend traces back even before the Common Era. As many know, the first emperor to unify China, Qin Shi Huang, had a deep disdain for Confucianism. Instead, he prioritized agriculture. Many scholars and traders fled his wrath, largely to the less reachable southern parts of China. From that time, regions like Guangdong, Fujian, Guangxi, and Hainan became popular refugees for the Chinese. Within just 15 years, after the fall of the Qin Dynasty, China went through endless dynastic changes. The average lifespan of a Chinese dynasty didn't even reach 65 years. With each change in rule, China became a battleground. Major revolts occurred, challenging unified reigns. Northern tribes, whenever faced with food scarcity in winters, would frequently breach the Great Wall and harass the local population. During these times, people flocked to the southern regions of China, seeking safety, particularly during the Mongol-led Yuan Dynasty and the Manchu-led Qing Dynasty. This meant that regions like Guangdong and Fujian faced a chronic shortage of arable land. The influx of migrants made it challenging for local residents to protect their properties. Those who couldn't find a place in southern China had to travel further south. This often meant crossing the South China Sea, with the nearest destination being the Philippines, home to the first Chinatown. This movement could be compared to the boat people who fled Vietnam during the 1970s and 80s. However, due to continuous strife in China and the consequent influx of refugees, the Philippines quickly reached its capacity. As a result, subsequent migrants had to travel even further, reaching countries in Southeast Asia like Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Chinese immigrants, who once lived cautiously in foreign lands, encountered a new era when European powers began making significant inroads into Asia in the late 16th century. While most of these Chinese migrants originally came from farming backgrounds in Southeast Asia, they predominantly engaged in trade. This was because, as foreigners, it was challenging for them to secure land for farming, leaving them with few options other than the trades typically avoided by the locals. Due to this, the Chinese were more knowledgeable about local affairs than anyone else. Colonial empires often employed these Chinese individuals as intermediaries for colonial governance. This pattern of European colonizers using a divide and rule strategy was prevalent throughout Southeast Asia. A significant moment that led many Chinese to leave their country was the Opium Wars in the 1800s. After winning, Britain took Hong Kong and opened various ports in Guangdong and Fujian. The European colonial powers in Southeast Asia needed Chinese labor for their extensive farms. The opened ports became almost extraterritorial, allowing countless Chinese seeking work to flood out without interference from the Qing Dynasty. Many of those who left China through ports like Guangzhou, Fuzhou, and Xiamen ended up in the US, Europe, and Australia. With the European powers halting the slave trade, there was a massive demand for workers in sugar and cotton plantations. Similarly, in the US, with the emancipation of African slaves, there was a dire need for workers in the gold and silver mines of California. Chinese laborers in Southeast Asia, known for their hard work, dedication, and physical endurance became highly popular with Western powers. Recognizing this, the British sent these Chinese workers to plantations in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, marking their entry into the West. These cheap Chinese workers were termed coolies. Taking Britain's lead, the U.S. also imported these coolies in large numbers for mining in the West, essentially substituting them for African slaves. These Chinese workers, 
just like their counterparts in Southeast Asia, were highly valued for their ambition to succeed. They worked diligently to earn money and generally didn't cause trouble. The construction of the Transcontinental Railroad saw even more Chinese set foot on American soil. The issue arose when the influx of Chinese became so substantial that Americans began to feel threatened. By the late 19th century, when Los Angeles had a mere population of 6,000, Chinese immigrants in the U.S. had reached about 100,000. Many were engaged in railway construction or working in the American West. This led to the implementation of the Chinese Exclusion Act, suddenly halting Chinese labor immigration. However, with the continued labor shortage, Japanese and Korean workers came in to replace the Chinese coolies. Just because there was a rise in the Chinese population didn't mean they could just establish Chinatowns wherever they went. The notion of Chinatown wasn't always a planned concept. The 16th century Chinatown in Manila, Philippines, was quite like the ghettos in Europe segregating Jews. The then ruling Spanish, noticing the increasing Chinese population, established Chinatown in Manila to ensure the Chinese didn't mingle with the Spanish whites. By the mid-18th century, when Chinatowns appeared in Indonesia, the Dutch were in control. They entrusted the Chinese with administrative and tax duties and also allowed them to engage in trade and lending. Naturally, being the colonial government's front men, they faced resentment from the natives. This animosity led to massacres and looting of Chinese establishments in various parts of Indonesia, causing the Chinese to band together, making their Chinatowns larger for defense. In Malaysia, amidst ongoing turmoil, the Chinese were pushed to a tiny piece of land at the edge of the territory and eventually expelled from the Federation. This forcedly independent piece of land later became Singapore. The development of Chinatowns in the US and the UK mirrored that of Southeast Asia. When the economic downturn hit in the late 19th century, Chinese laborers, who were hired for low wages, became scapegoats, labeled as job stealers. Chinese workers, after enduring one of the most significant mass lynchings in US history in Los Angeles, migrated to places like San Francisco and Vancouver, Canada, seeking less racial discrimination. Wherever they went, they tended to cluster in specific areas for better defense. It was essential to increase their numbers to face the local population. This led to the creation of Chinatowns. Essentially, these were survival strategies developed by the overseas Chinese who didn't have the protection of the Chinese government. Despite these challenges, most Chinatowns have thrived. In Southeast Asia, the overseas Chinese community has a significant economic influence. In the US and Europe, Chinatown properties, now situated in city centers, are worth a fortune. Many Chinese attribute their hard work and passion for education to Confucian values. Initially, their plan was to make money and then return to China. This is why many didn't bother learning the local language or assimilating into their new communities. Business was often conducted within family units or with those from the same hometown. This insularity was seen not just from outsiders, but also within different Chinese groups. However, due to ongoing turmoil in China, including the Sino-Japanese War and the Chinese Civil War, many couldn't return. When China underwent its communist revolution, many overseas Chinese found their path home blocked for decades. This has led to an observation that Chinatowns represent Chinese migrants who are neither wholly from China nor entirely foreign. At its core, the history of Chinatown is about enduring hardship while working in foreign lands. It embodies the primal desire for survival and success. But from a different perspective, Chinatowns are the result of the largest diaspora in human history. In a broader context, human history is a story of migrations in search of a better life. Examples include Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, Native Americans crossing the Bering Strait, the massive migrations of the Germanic tribes that changed European history, the large-scale Irish immigration to the U.S., and the Vietnamese boat people. All were seeking a better life. However, in scale and duration, none of these migrations compare to that of the Chinese. The renowned migration of the Germanic tribes spanned several centuries but involved just over a million people. The number of Irish or Vietnamese refugees, even at their peak, didn't exceed 4 million. But the migration of the Chinese, leaving out ancient history and focusing just on the late 20th century after Deng Xiaoping's reforms, exceeds 10 million. 
While the reasons, origins, and motivations of these migrants have evolved, their movement is ongoing. And yet, with over 1.4 billion people still in China, it underscores the immense population of the country.